are going to get started. Hello, everyone. Welcome to this final colloquium. <laughs> One day I'll get that right. Welcome to this final presentation uh, from the University of Washington Department of Communication and our wonderful partners. Uh, before we begin this event, I just want to start with a land acknowledgement from the University of Washington. The University of Washington acknowledges the Coast Salish peoples of this land, the land which touches the shared waters of all tribes and bands within the Duwamish, Puyallup, Suquamish, Tulalip, and Muckleshoot nations. And with that being said, I'd also like to introduce you to our wonderful moderator for today's event, Dr. Romina Joseph. Uh, Dr. Joseph is the Presidential Term Professor of Communication and Adjunct Professor of American Ethnic Studies and Gender, Women, and Sexuality Studies at the University of Washington. She is also the Founding and Acting Director of the University of Washington's Center for Communication, Difference, and Equity, and creator of the Interrupting Privilege Program. You may also find her working as Associate Dean of Equity and Justice in Graduate Programs at the University of Washington's Graduate School. Uh, and she also writes books and articles, including her newly published book, Generation Mixed Goes to School. And hopefully you'll be able to come back and join us on May 5th for Relina's Book Talk. But without further ado, uh, Dr. Joseph, I hand the event over to you. All right, thank you so much, Megan. <clears throat> Excuse me, and thank you to all of you for coming here today for our closing colloquium. Um, we've had a wonderful year of uh, race and media talks this year, and we are just thrilled that Pre Professor Raven Rod Lloyd is going to close us out um, with a scintillating talk, I know, about Permit Patty and Karen. I mean, who, and could this be a better talk? I'm, I'm incredibly excited about this. Uh, so let me just introduce her to you. Um, she is a digital media studies scholar whose research examines the intersections of race, gender, and media culture. She is an assistant professor in the communication department at Gonzaga University, and she's currently working on her first book, which is titled Black Resistance Will Be Digitized, Strategic Rearticulations of Resistance in the Digital Age. More broadly, she's interested in Black publics online who deploy their social and cultural tools to challenge media institutions and narrative. Her work has appeared in journals such as Communication, Culture, and Critique, Television and New Media, the Journal of Communication Inquiry, and in the edited collections Race and Media, where Michelle Sturgis and I have a sister piece to hers, uh, the Handbook of Diaspora's Media and Culture, and Twitter, the Public Sphere, and the Chaos of Online Deliberation. She has very excitingly received uh, an American Association of University Women Grant Fellowship for the 21-22 academic year. And she's also part of a race and algorithms group, which has been awarded funding of $1.2 million over the next three years by the Minerva Research Initiative. So doing incredibly important work. Ultimately, her scholarship makes central the ways that Black and African American publics tap into long existing channels of communication towards the goals of community, survival, and visibility. I'm thrilled that she's here to share her knowledge, and um, please join me in welcoming Professor Rod Lloyd. Myself. Thank you so much, Dr. Joseph. Thank you all for being here. I'm so excited that I can see your faces. Sometimes you never know if you can. Um, so I'm excited that we can sort of be in a space together. Thanks to Dr. Joseph for inviting me. You've been an incredible mentor, so thank you. I am going to share my screen. Let's see. And let's make this bigger. Can we see that okay? Okay, set my timer here. All right, so hi everyone. Like Dr. Joseph mentioned, my name is Raven Raj Lloyd, and I'm thrilled to talk with you today about my research involving black users, digital practices, and specifically um, racial humor. So I'll talk about Karens and permit patties and all the things. Um, I'd like to give you a sense of where I'll be taking you today um, in our time together. So I'll begin by telling you a little bit about myself and how I came to the research that I do, um, and specifically how I approach Black Digital Studies. 
Then I'll give you a few examples of my research agenda. I'll, I'll be sure to be brief here um, so that we can get to the permit Patty and Karen um, article I'm working on, um, which I'll spend the majority of my time on. And then I'll wrap up with where I see my research going in the next few years. So I was trained in the journalism discipline for both my master's and undergraduate degrees at the University of Missouri before doing my PhD at the University of Iowa in communication studies, which is based in a, um, a critical humanities approach to media studies. So this kind of training affords me an interdisciplinary view when I ask the questions that I do in my work, I think which lends itself really well to Black digital studies. Um, I feel comfortable in social scientific spaces, and I see the value of interdisciplinary thinking, for example, between computer science, journalism, and critical race folks. Um, and I'll show an example of this kind of work um, in just a second. I found my home when I found critical race theory and intersectionality. As a scholar and teacher, I continue or I try to continue the validation that I received in writings like Bell Hooks's Thinking Feminist, Thinking Black. Um, something I'm coming back to, especially during the pandemic, like the, the power of our work, right? When we feel like, what am I doing? <laughs> you know, the power of writing and the power of, of what we're doing. Um, a critical race theory approach also allows me to start with the question of race um, in my inquiries of media technologies and society. So a focus on power and identity is not an add-on, um, but it's part and parcel of the very makeup of, for example, algorithmic culture or social network sites. My scholarly identity then is rooted in being trained between the social science and humanities fields when it comes to the study of race and media. My research tends to cohere around the kinds of impacts that black digital publics have on technology. So I'll talk a little bit today about what digital black publics do to digital networks and to digital culture. I'm also interested in the kinds of templates that Black digital publics offer to other activists movements now and in the future. So I'll talk about TikTok and I'm definitely curious in the Q&A to hear from students and other people um, about your thoughts. And then I ask questions in my work about the opportunities for productive collaboration between critical race um, and data science scholars. I see the field um, making exciting strides between collaboration uh, between these two fields. First, much of the work that I do considers the impact of Black digital publics and that impact on digital culture. So whether my lens is through live tweeting, familial clapbacks, um, or subtle post-racial resistance, my work operates within this productive space of Black users reconfiguring um, digital culture and the inherent dominance that said culture often entails. For example, I recently published a book chapter Dr. Joseph mentioned in NYU Press's Race and Media in 2021 about the hashtag Thanksgiving Clapback. In the piece, I demonstrate how Black users share and archive their traditions and experiences, which often run counter to dominant narratives of family, food, and culture. You can think of the everlasting divide between sweet potato pie, right, and, and pumpkin pie. Um, this yearly commiseration online centralizes Black family and linguistic traditions, the clapback, right, which in turn disrupts historical and contemporary accounts of national gatherings that assume a dominant Eurocentric vantage point. This is also a really fun piece to write because I'm relying on Raquel Gates's framework of um, negativity here um, to trace how the clapback is a call to Black linguistic traditions like playing the dozens. Uh, which involves verbally sparring with, you, with each other, right? With your opponent, uh, with quick wit and playful banter. I'm also arguing that black folks importantly utilize negative stereotypes, which dares outsiders to look, but don't touch. Um, so cultural appropriation and exploitation become near impossible through the use of these insider conversations that on the surface seem outrageous and problematic, right? but I argue are quite productive in archiving black familiar traditions. So outsiders, they can look at these tweets, um, retweeting it may be a little bit problematic for them, right? So that's what I'm arguing about the cultural appropriation piece um, there. I also recently published a piece in communication cultural and critique, actually relying on Relina Joseph's work on post-racial re resistance here. Um, as I'm thinking and 
I'm, I'm thinking about the ways that Black women use resistance strategies and everyday resistance strategies to rethink networked culture as being beyond race. And when I say that, I mean, um, when I say networked culture being beyond race, I mean this idea of a neoliberal, a neoliberal digital environment. Happy to talk about that more in the Q and A, but essentially that just means folks who argue, well, anybody has access to Twitter, right? Like anybody can tweet with, people who have access to technology. So what are y'all still fussing about with Black Lives Matter? Like equality is done. We all have technology now, right? And so I'm arguing that Black women in this piece um, from some interviews that I did with Black women in St. Louis in 2017, um, I'm saying here that Black users circumvent and expose the very logics of online media as being beyond race through their everyday resistance strategies, which must confront issues of, for example, what it means to be professional in the workspace or hypersexuality for Black women. Um, many of the women talked about strategically using visual signifiers online, like a profile picture of their natural hair, uh, to resist notions of what it means to look professional with their natural hair because they know their boss follows them on Instagram. Um, several women talked about one worked for a major banking company, for example, and said she was up for a raise. Her boss said, you need to straighten your hair because you're going to be dealing with higher investment people at the bank. And several other women had similar examples in their own fields. So for their online networks, this was their way of posting their profile pictures with natural hair. They know their boss follows them. It doesn't seem like resistance. It's just a profile picture, right? Um, but I'm saying that um, the very fact that these women can't just outright say, right, talk about hypersexuality or talk about um, being what it means to be professional, uh, they have to use these clandestine ways of resisting um, that's a way that, uh, the black woman sort of expose these networks, right. Of, of, um, digital post-racial resistance. So the question then of how black digital publics reconfigure digital spaces considers the elements of black discursivity online as it does something to the surrounding technological and cultural environment. Another question I considered in my work looks at the broader implications of Black digital practices on varied activist movements. I'll be talking today about the racial humor paper, so I won't go into detail quite yet, um, except to say that it's currently accepted to the American Journal of Play special issue, Blackness at Play, and it'll be out um, December 2021, so end of this year. Um, the piece you see down on the bottom, the civic debate and self-care, came out of the focus groups I mentioned with the Black women in St. Louis, where the women started to hint at mental health and um, um, care being missing both within and outside of their own communities. You see the quote here on the screen where a participant mentions, we need life skills to deal with. She hints at generational trauma. Um, and so in this piece, the book chapter, um, that I just highlighted down here, you see that's a civic debate in self-care. I'm arguing that um, care is a part of resistance. Um, these black women create networks of care. Um, there's another quote where this woman's talking about religion and, and blackness. So she's saying, most black folks just say, go to church, go pray on it, which is definitely my family. So in, in that way, they have to create networks of care for each other. And um, I extend that with, um, some focus groups. So Dr. Joseph mentioned, I just got this AAUW grant to add 50 more participants over the next year. So that's 10 focus groups, five women per group. So I'm, ex I'm hoping to um, update the focus groups, especially given the pandemic, given um, racial justice cries of the last year. Um, but also I'm interested to see uh, care over time through these focus groups. Like what does it mean in 2017 when Black Lives Matter was still fairly nascent to now where we're seeing racial trauma, you know, and, and death all the time online? Uh, so what does care look like in those two time periods? All right. And then lastly, my work explores Black discursive practices and their impact, not just on digital or social culture, but on algorithmic culture, which has come to shape, right? So much of our health, um, our criminal justice and our professional decisions. 
I've been a part of an interdisciplinary research group for the last five years with some wonderful colleagues from computer science, journalism, and comm studies, where we ask questions about the impact of algorithms on digital identities. This May will be presenting at the International Communication Association uh, with a paper we're working on about how to study race at scale, um, which is very difficult. So I'm happy to talk in the Q&A about that because, I mean, the two seem completely antithetical to each other, right? Like critical race and um, quantitative work. And so we're exploring those issues in that paper. And is there a way that that um, we can study algorithms more responsibly rather than essentializing race? Happy to talk talk more about that one. And then as Dr. Joseph mentioned, we just got a grant to study um, extremism online over the next three years. So especially given things like the Capitol riot, right? We know from January. Um, and I mean, this idea came out of um, thinking about white supremacy in particular and what makes people radical, especially online. So what technological mediators are there? When you're watching a YouTube video, you start with the DNC, the Democrat National Convention or RNC, and then end up with, you know, all kinds of, of things. And so we know that shooters, Dylan Roof, for example, cite in his manifesto when he, he shot and killed those nine black clergymen. Um, we know that he, he had a manifesto where he cited YouTube, right? And autoplay videos. Um, and so we're interested in this, in this work in no way to isolate technology and say technology is the only reason that's making people radical. That's not it. Um, but clearly there's a, there's a mediator here in, in technology. That's what we're exploring. So through these projects, I'm asking questions about the ways that Black digital practices influence the networked world around us, be it through digital culture, online activism, and or algorithms. My book then, Reshaping Black Resistance, which currently has the proposal and sample chapters under review at the University of California Press, builds on these questions and focuses my analytical lens to consider the impact of black digital practices within and across our own communities and practices. So not just what do black digital practices do for everybody else, what do we do for each other? And that's where the care chapter comes into. Specifically, I'm interested in black resistance strategies like racial humor, which I'll talk about today, or digital, archive, um, digital archiving of culture, and I'm tracing what led us to these discursive moments online. The book connects the political and the social to demonstrate how Black users strategically rearticulate their responses to oppression, as well as strategically rearticulating oppression itself. I'll talk about that with innocence and white women today, or white womanhood, in ways that highlight Black public's rich historical traditions and to reveal the shifting nature of both oppression and resistance, particularly in the digital age. In doing so, I'm connecting the threads of creativity and malleability that Black publics have long fashioned in using media for community and survival. So each chapter of the book chronicles a different resistance strategy to showcase the strategic shifting of resistance over time and across media platforms. I begin the book by talking about racial humor as a resistance strategy before delving into archiving as also resistive in nature. So chapter two details how black publics have been archiving our past pain and joy online as a form of resistance. While the world suddenly awakened in June 2020 um, to the significance of Juneteenth, right, which is the celebration of slaves being freed in Texas um, in the 19th century, Black users online have been curating their culture, both past and present, as a way to rearticulate access to this culture. In other words, I'm arguing here that so much of Black history has been barred access to traditional museums, to education systems, to public campaigns. In turn, Black users online step in to archive their own history from Juneteenth to Black family traditions. And I'll be presenting some arguments from this chapter at the American Studies Association in Puerto Rico, um, maybe in person, I don't know, we'll see if it happens, if it's safe to, um, this October. 
Chapter three draws from my earlier work to investigate the act of care as the very crux of rearticulation itself, which is making the political possible through the community building efforts of the social. Um, I mentioned the AAU dub grant here. Um, I'll say that it was also important for me to update this data, like I mentioned, because I wanted to see patterns of resistance over time. So this chapter will have um, 50 additional participants and I'll be able to compare and contrast 2017 to 2021. So where's the previous chapters analyze the re um, rearticulations of resistance online? Chapter four uses cancel culture to examine the limits and complexities of resistance in the digital age. The idea of cancel culture, we know, right, refers to online users, collective stifling of economic and social productivity of those in power. Kevin Hart's been canceled, Cardi B's been canceled, but also to the more serious, right, like Harvey Weinstein, Weinstein's been canceled. Um, this chapter delves into the historical legacy of Black publics as they have long deployed economic separation as a resistance strategy, boycotting, right? Um, and ultimately, I discuss the ways that networked culture repackages this economic resistance strategy um, to favor the speed of information, the permanency of information, and the privileging of individual takedowns. Um, I argue that this is a limit of online resistance because we're not paying attention to sy broader systemic issues. We're paying attention to taking down one person and thinking that we fix the problem, which other folks like Dr. Joseph have written about. Such limitations, however, point to the ways that Black public's rearticulations can be a necessary template for resistance strategies across marginalized groups and media channels by demonstrating the value of flexible and strategic resistance, um, especially over time. Uh, and then I worked out some of these arguments on a panel at SCMS earlier this year, Society of Cinema and Media Studies. I'm also itching to do a class on cancel culture. I feel like and maybe you all have one, I'd love to hear from you, but I feel like people would be into it, students, I mean. Um, I've also, and then chapter five, lastly, uses the common refrain on black Twitter. Uh, the delegation has voted, which is rooted in, um, or is a nod to the cultural classic, The Chappelle Show, right? As a jumping off point to investigate how on, online black publics rearticulate power and influence. The phrase the delegation has voted is often used by black users to call attention to social happenings and issues wherein the collective and their decisions are prioritized. The latest I saw was um, the delegation has voted, DAPs are currently suspended due to the Rona, DAPs being the physical sort of embrace right between black folks and particularly black men. So DAPs are being suspended, we can't touch each other because of coronavirus. So um, ultimately in this chapter, I'm thinking about what it means for black folks to have the power, right? Like we are a delegation and we imagine um, having the power to tell people what to do. Um, ultimately throughout all these chapters, I'm encouraging readers to create and cultivate lasting communities necessary for social and political change by threading together black user strategies of reshaping past resistance strategies and imagining a future of joy, community, and agency through their digital media practices. I imagine the racial humor chapter to really frame the book's approach of Black resistance strategy as being strategically malleable over time. So my research questions are grounded in the theoretical relationship between racial humor and resistance. I'm drawing from and centering Black feminist thought in its epistemological focus, not only on interlocking oppressions, but the possibility of hope and joy within and outside of domains of power. So you'll see here on the screen in this particular piece, I'm asking um, what discurse, I'm using play, the journal article is American Journal of Play. So I'm using play to frame racial humor as tied to resistance. I'm asking how black digital publics use discursive play. So thinking about the clapback again, to critique contemporary iterations of white womanhood um, and the police state online. And then secondly, that should be a number two, my apologies. Secondly, um, I'm, curious about what these strategies of resistance and play demonstrate more broadly about the rearticulations of innocence. Like what does it mean to be innocent? And I'm thinking about black children here. I'll talk about that in a second. So I won't go into too much detail about the theories, 
Um, but I think it's important to um, cite who I'm who I'm pulling from here. Um, <clears throat> I'm working from Patricia Hill Collins's framework of domains of power when I'm talking and thinking about resistance. So she writes, for example, about work in the cracks. Like, what does it mean to resist within an institution? What does it mean to resist without or outside of an institution? In, in my work, the institution being digital media, digital media culture, or one of those institutions. Um, and then, of course, I'm working from Bell Hooks's work, the oppositional gaze and talking back. In some of my work, I talk about not talking back as a resistance strategy, especially for Black women online. And that's the care chapter. And then I work from Catherine Squires' work of marginal public spheres, right? Like an enclave, you can remove yourself um, from the public and that can be resistive. Um, and then other folks, of course, Audre Lorde, Catherine Knight still has written um, about digital Black feminism as also centered in this enclave. So when I talk about resistance, um, this is what, what I mean. Okay, so I'm thinking through in this piece, racial humor, specifically as discursive play. And I'm pulling from the, the play literature here, which has a lot of gaps when it comes to race. And so essentially folks have written about like a sociocultural ways that people in Mayan culture play, for example, and how it's different than Eurocentric ways of playing. But I'm really asking like, who is the freedom to play? Can we all play the same, right? We know the answer is no. Black children, Tamir Rice, for example, doesn't have the freedom to play with a toy gun the same way as, um, as somebody else, right? Who, who um, has a dominant identity. So um, my intervention, one of my interventions in this piece is in the play literature to center blackness um, and argue that play doesn't look the same for everybody. I'm also heavily relying on, of course, folks like Samuel Janis, Mel Watkins, and Lawrence Levine, who've written quite extensively about um, Black culture and Black humor. Um, I'll talk about Mel Watkins' work with specifically with racial humor. If anyone's seen that book, it is thick. <laughs> so it is, uh, you know, I'll condense what I'm using in this talk. Um, but they've written quite a bit about racial humor specifically as tied to resistance as well. And then, of course, um, folks like Henry Louis Gates Jr., right, has written about signifying. And I mentioned playing the dozens earlier, this sort of back and forth between people as as a um, sparring, a verbal sparring. And so I'll talk about black linguistic traditions um, when it comes to racial humor and Karen's as well. OK, so Mel Watkins um, writes about the ingredients of black humor as you'll see on the screen, black laughter, an outlandish story or tall tale, one shaped by historically minority status and importantly, overcoming adversities. It's not all, as people like to say, like the chip on the shoulder or whatever, right? Um, realism, uh, so there has to be some kind of biting truth in the humor and the physical use of the body. So when it comes to Permit Patty and Karen, I'm really gonna be pulling here from the outlandish story or the tall tale and um, the ingredient of being shaped by minority status and overcoming adversities to argue that these memes are not just funny, they're actually part of a long history of ingredients of black humor um, and pull from narrative, for example, pull from storytelling um, and have biting truth in them in order to be resistive, in order to do something. Okay, I'll briefly touch on white femininity and innocence. And I wanna be clear, when I talk about white femininity and white womanhood, um, folks um, have written quite extensively, Sarah Benet Weiser, for example, um, about the difference between white womanhood and white women. So we're not talking about the person, and that's the same with whiteness, right? We're not talking about a person like, you so-and-so, Sarah or Karen, we're talking about the systemic um, sort of institution of white womanhood, which I'll get more specific here in just a second. So um, white femininity is discursively tied to purity and vulnerability, imperialism, modernity, and civilization. As such, white women have historically been positioned in contrast to the uncivil and pathologized other. 
Um, Richard Dyer, for example, famously writes about the construction of whiteness and demonstrates white feministic ties to purity, and particularly so in U.S. Christian ideology. I think it's important to go through this history, again, just to frame Karen's and Parma Petty's as more than just like, you know, it's funny today, right? We're, we're talking about a long history of resistance to white femininity. Um, the ideal white women is further tied to uh, Western imperial discourses. So writing about transnational motherhood, for example, Shom argues that white women such as Angelina Jolie and Princess Diana, which I have pictures on the next slide, let's see, um, serve to represent the ideal modern and global ambassador, right? As they go out um, primarily into the global South and quote, save children. So these children are then conditioned to grow into modern Western citizens by white women who act as primary caretakers in the home. Um, I grew up in Jamaica, I lived there until I was 13. And when Princess Diana died, I mean, the whole world mourned, but I'm telling you, Jamaica was for real in mourning and talk about post-colonial you know, ties to the British empire. Um, but I mean, the I vividly remember photos being circulated of her with people who looked like us, right? Like, so it's all very sort of strategic. And I'm a fan, like, I'm not saying she's a bad person. Um, but at least what Shom and others are arguing is that folks like Angelina Jolie, um, Princess Diana, uh, serve to, to represent this sort of savior, like I'm going out into the world and saving the children, right? Um, as Shom writes, quote, to produce modern subjects, is to ensure that the home is the basic unity um, of the nation um, and the nation is civilized for home is the site of production of the nation's future. So the home here is tied to the nation, at least in the Western sense. Uh, white women then have been transfixed, particularly in, me particularly in media culture, as the ideal civilized subject as the ultimate signifier for domesticity, for homeless, um, homeliness, um, and for civilization. Okay, and then I wanna tie um, the last piece of Karen and Parma Patties to the police state, because it's not just resisting white femininity, but also these memes are, are resisting white femininity, specifically, in, and it's tied to the police state. So whereas black men have historically been treated as threats to the nation and more directly um, to white women, um, what users do online using racial humor is, um, is crucial because black folks are narrating their experiences and they're finding a way to laugh anyway. These experiences have to do with lynching for looking at a white woman, a white woman, right? These experiences have to do with having to cross the street because um, a white woman is passing by. So these are real um, dangerous experiences that black folks have lived with and we're finding a way to laugh about it. Like we're finding a way to use racial humor um, to live anyway. So specific to the police state, white women's constructed vulnerability has continued to strategically advance law and order in the US. For instance, a criminal justice system protects white middle-class and heterosexual women um, by leaving women of color, poor, working class, queer and gender non-conforming women vulnerable. Um, I'm happy to talk more about criminal justice system, white femininity afterwards as well. I wanna make sure to get to the, the findings. Okay, so in the article I used in Vivo software, which allows you to qualitatively collect tweets and it allows you to analyze data based on those tweets. So I collected a thousand po um, posts on two separate platforms, Twitter and Instagram. I moved from Twitter um, because of its discursive elements, like Andre Brock and others have written about um, the clapback and um, call and response on Twitter. So Twitter works really well with black audiences. But I also moved from Twitter to Instagram too, because I, I was seeing with the memes a lot of visual representations of Karens, right? That you just, you're not gonna capture necessarily on Twitter. Um, I use Invivo software to look for the keywords permit Patty and Karen with and without the hashtags because users were using them um, not just with hashtags. 
And then I conducted a critical technocultural discourse analysis. So essentially that's a discourse analysis um, that allows you to look at the material elements of the technology. So why Instagram, why Twitter, as well as the cultural elements, the discursive sort of linguistic elements as well. And then I just want to put the research questions back up. Okay, so the first theme I'm finding was that black users are using racial humor to create an omniscient narrator. Um, in this sense, the black users are fashioning racial humor as play to craft the character of Permit Patty on Twitter and across the internet in order to retell and place themselves at the center of a historically painful relationship between white women and the police state. Uh, the online narrative came about after Jordan Rogers, who was eight years old in June 2018, was selling water bottles outside of her mother's home in San Francisco to try and earn enough money to go to Disneyland. Allison Edel, who you see in the picture here on the cell phone, uh, is a white woman and claimed that Rogers was selling those water bottles without a permit and proceeded to call the police. It was then that Rogers' aunt, Erin Austin, recorded Edel crouching behind a wall with her cell phone to her ear. After Austin followed Edel with her camera and declared the whole world is gonna see you, boo, Edel's defense for her interference was simple. Yeah, the little girl's illegally selling water without her permit. Like that was her reason for calling the police. Austin immediately posted the video to Twitter with the hashtag permit Patty and the white woman character was born. So I'm arguing here that Black users online use humor as play to create an intricate story in which they are the omniscient narrator, they have the power to reposition and reduce the authority of the police and white women's claim to protection therein. The omniscient narrator also carries with it traditions of oral storytelling um, that absent institutionalized mechanisms with which to preserve their history, um, Black folks have regularly employed, right? Um, and Lawrence Levine writes about sermons and, and oral storytelling as well. So I'm arguing here that um, Black users use permit patty memes in order to, you see her like back there in the, in the bus, they're placing her in different historical um, conditions. So here you see her with Rosa Parks and they're retelling um, historical stories in order to talk about how outlandish calling the police is, right? Like you're on the wrong side of history and I'm gonna show you in different time periods um, how outlandish you are. Um, I also found it super interesting for folks interested in Afrofuturism. Um, and Afrofuturism is all about uh, revisioning the past, right? And speculating ideas for the future via cultural critique. So I, I'm not seeing a lot about Afrofuturism as connected to Karen and Permit Patties. I don't think, you know, <laughs> The two seem to go in context with each other, but, but I, I'm seeing connections here, I think are interesting. Okay. Um, and then the memes I'm arguing also reimagine innocence through black children and black girls in particular. You'll see here, Permit Patty, somebody put, you know, Photoshopped her and said, hello, I'd like to report um, some gang activity. And you see the user here says my favorite meme so far, it's funny, but sad. So here black users have the power to put her into a story. You could not get a more innocent looking picture, right? Um, and, and the face of Perma Patty is important because she looks villainous. She's no longer the innocent white woman who is crying and utilizing white tears, which other folks like Brittany Cooper have written about. Um, the black girls are smiling, right? They're not the ones in pain. Um, and we're sort of shifting what we mean by innocence through means like this. Okay. I also wanna say about the Obama meme here. So um, the circulating image of former president Barack Obama also reminds us that no matter how respectable and high profile a black person is, white women will often doubt their credentials. So folks like Sade Davis have written about the disrespectability of black women online. Um, so I think there's something also going on about critiquing white femininity, but also critiquing our own respectability in our own communities. Like it don't matter how high you climb, you know what I mean? Like you still have to um, contend with racism. Okay. 
And then this um, is just a quote from Mel Watkins where he's talking about the absurdity, right? And you just have to put permanent Patty in absurd situations. Um, and that's sort of the history of racial humor here in terms of black wit. So um, with these memes then, I'm arguing that black users are challenging tenets of respectability. Again, not just outside of their own communities, but within them as well. You couldn't get anybody more respectable than Obama serving food at a what seems to be a soup kitchen or something. And then black children are also challenging the adult or um, black users, I'm sorry, also challenging the adultification of black children. Um, again, we know that folks like Tamir Rice playing with a toy gun. Um, and based on research, we know that black children are seen as adults or given less mentoring opportunities um, and seen as adults in other ways. And so here, black users are reframing the story to put black children at the center and black innocence um, at the center of the story. Okay, so my second <clears throat> finding I wanna talk about is the use of storytelling to create an inverse of stereotypes, specifically through the name Karen and the alliteration of the name Permit Patty um, to create a monolith for white women in order to expose and update um, the relationship with the police state. So in a meme like this one, you see the inversion of the reverse racism argument so the user says, I don't understand how white women get to use the K word all freely, like, you know, K exclamation exc or um, asterisk, asterisk. So here you'll, you'll see they're inverting the N word, right? Um, as soon as I, a black person, want to say it, all of a sudden I'm racist. So you hopefully see the sarcastic tone in the tweet. And here the users are inverting, again, inversion being um, a strategy of racial humor that has long existed. This isn't new with the Karen memes but they're flipping um, re this reverse racism argument in order to show the absurdity of reverse racism, the reverse racism argument, right? So they're flipping the privilege of dominance here. Um, again, I think this is important because black folks are also imagining themselves as the dominant group. Like what does it look like for me to be dominant um, and be absurd in this way? This is how I'm gonna use my dominance, right? And then um, like most memes and Henry Jenkins and others have written about this, right? There's an, an element of intertextuality. So memes have got to reference something else. You'll see this one where it references um, Jay-Z and Kanye West song, and in Paris, except it's Karen's in Paris and the Karen's is blocked out again. Um, and I mean, this person went through the whole lyrics of the song, like they went through, you know, <laughs> a lot of detail in order to um, invert hip hop here. I actually think this is super interesting because I think it's a call to um, hip hop and uh, its cultural roots, right? Like hip hop and gangster rap we know came out of the 1980s um, out of struggle and out of being pushed out of all these other respectable spaces. And so it's just ridiculous to think of white women in those as, as having that, those struggles and, and existing in these hip hop spaces, if, if that makes sense. Okay, I'm also following Bambi Haggins' work who writes amazingly about um, black laughter too. So here we see that black users are shifting the balance of power in relations um, and in relation to culture. So they have the power to create the characters. They have the power to put the characters wherever they want in historical situations, in front of Obama. Um, and again, the police is just a non-factor. Like they're not even a factor in the story, right? And then they're creating a monolith for white womanhood in that um, instead of in the paper I talk about the Shanene stereotypes, right? So black women with the large hoops and all the, the black women tropes that we see on, for example, Martin with Shanene, the actual character Shanene, all of a sudden Karen is the monolith and she has a hairstyle and she has um, a certain kind of walk and a certain kind of talk. So she's stereotyped now in a way that inverts what, what black women have had to deal with um, for centuries, right? Okay, so I'm really interested then in this idea of rearticulating. Ooh, that's my timer. I'm really interested in this idea of rearticulating cultural understandings of innocence. 
I think what's absent is just as important as what's present in the memes. Again, the police isn't talked about. We're not seeing memes of the police. We're not seeing memes of they're not a part of the story. They're irrelevant, right? Um, but still critiqued by proxy of, of white womanhood. Um, so I'm, I'm thinking through then this idea of we are articulating in a sense from white womanhood to blackness and to black children in particular. I also think there's something going on with the digital circulation of racial trauma. So racial humor does something to give us sort of a breath online, right? Where we see so much racial trauma. Um, this is a way that we can resist and still and laugh. And then as I'm arguing then, um, Karen and Permit Patty really forces cultural conversations about black bodies as they have been historically been criminalized um, and a part of the police state. Here we have to talk about Karens, like whether you're a part of these um, hashtags or not, more than likely because of trending topics, you're gonna, you're gonna know what they are. Okay, so quickly I will mention future directions. Of course I lost my place because I got excited and started talking about Permit Patty. All right, so in building on this first book, I'm thinking through my second project or my second book project as exploring digital black intergenerational practices. According to my students, black Twitter is now for quote old heads and Black TikTok affords them more opportunities for user engagement through video, video remixing, for example. So I guess like Black Twitter is no longer a thing for them, which I think is super interesting. So what happens when a generation has grown up? Like, you know, I grew up on Black Twitter. What happens when I age out, right? And, and where does that go in terms of activism? So I'd love to explore not only the affordances of platforms as they serve different uses for Black users across ages, but also what social and political media messages perhaps lend a hand in the migration of intergenerational Black networks online. I think there are interesting connections to be made between political racial movements like the future of Black Lives Matter, for example, um, as Black users continue to creatively imagine new ways to shape media to our, to our needs. So along with the book, which is on the docket, right, for the next year or two, um, I'll be working with the grant research currently underway to get um, the extremism project done and then the focus groups for chapter three as well. I'm also really interested in being a part of more public initiative conversations to better connect these creative and multidimensional black digital practices to more public facing efforts. Um, and I'll stop there. Thank you very much for your time. I'm excited to have conversation. That was incredible. Um, I'm, I, I'm, I'm so excited about it. Uh, I'm so excited about the book, the book project. And I really love the fact that you open in, um, the book is opening up with this chapter in particular because of the way that it brings us joy, right? This is, this is black joy. Mm. And, um, mm -hmm. and I think that this is what we, you know, we, we understand that the trauma is there and it's referencing the trauma. Um, yeah. Uh, and it's and and it's helping us um, and it's helping us cope. And I think that that even even there's a type of care that you are taking for us as readers by by bringing us into this way. So I think it's it's just it's very very thoughtful. So I would um, I would love to open this up to um, to questions. I know that we have lots of folks who have questions. Um, please go ahead and um, raise your raise your little. Um, electronic hand and the reactions, please. And then I'll, I'll see you with a question here. You can put a question into the chat as well. And um, and we'll go ahead and, and get started. Um, I don't know if you saw also, um, Raven, that the, the chat was just blown up. You can, That's what I'm looking <laughs> at. There was a lot of, of co-signing happening. People were feeling it for Living sure. Living single, shout out. Yes, yeah. <laughs> So, um, so it looks like, it, and this is an interesting question here. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and, and Angela, I don't know if you'd like to ask this question yourself, but I'd like to invite you if you feel like I can ask it, but if you'd like to come, come on to our little st electronic stage here and ask yeah, the sure. question, please. 
Um, I was wondering, you know, thank you for the talk. It was really interesting, but I was wondering more about the Karen stereotype and how that kind of fits into an identity or should we be thinking of it more as an attitude, right? Because typically in media, we see Karens being, you know, kind of figured as the white female and, Mm -hmm. you know, that's sort of the stories that we hear, but could that attitude be carried by people who are non-white or non-female? Ooh, I love this question. And thank you, Angela. Yes. And that gets to my point about white womanhood as opposed to white women, right? So white womanhood is a structural institution, um, much like structural racism. And that's what I was talking about with the nation as tied to um, the police state and needing white women in order for the nation to to succeed, right? The nation being the U.S. nation Mm -hmm. and purity. So absolutely, like it, it could totally be attitudes. I think blackness needs to be in the story though. Like blackness has always got to be centered as um, someone trying to enter their space and then pushing back. So it could be attitude, but but it's about blackness. Does that make sense? Yeah, it does. Thank you. Thank you. That was a cool question. And I, you know, and I was wondering if, 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 the, if Angela was going, going here, but part of what I was wondering about was, um, is uh, a stereotype is right to use the Patricia Hill Collins. It's a controlling image. Mm -hmm. Can we have a controlling image for a group of people who fundamentally are empowered? Right. And we can talk about certainly the, 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 you know, the issues of, um, of, of gender um, Mm -hmm. for white women, but, but in the spaces that you're looking at and the control and the regulation of black bodies, they're incredibly empowered. Yeah. So that this kind of, that's where I thought Angela was going in terms of, um, the the attitude as opposed to thinking about the the, the controlling image that might mm-hmm. connote um, a disenfranchisement yeah. Yeah. of white women. Yeah, I appreciate that um, that point, Rolina. Absolutely, I'll know yeah, if it's I right. Think, but. I think the inversion is there. I think you're right, though. It's not necessarily inversion of a of a stereo of a stereotype in terms of uh, a one to one comparison, right? Because of power. Mm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Right, right. And, and um, the question is, uh, for me, at least, is how t- and we don't know this, but how time bound is this going to be? It's, mm-hmm. a, it's a Karen, right. it's a permit patty. Yeah. Right. Um, because we also know that that um, that representation is, is, um, we can see it against a whole multitude of other very complex images of white women, yeah. you know, as opposed yeah. to um, very small, limiting, controlling images yeah. of um, of all other BIPOC folks. Yeah. Right. Yep. Um, but I, I have lots of questions. I'm, I won't go there because I see I see you have one. I know from, you're giving um, me ideas and I'm trying to, <laughs> to, you know, push them down. So other people I love this work. Can. Yes. <laughs> um, uh, we have one of our PhD students, um, Lando Tosaya. Would you like to come in? and uh, ask the question, please. I'm waiting for- Yes, Amanda's hold gonna... on two um, seconds, oh, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> you caught me right when I ran outside. Oh, so, oh I'm sorry, um, No, 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 that's totally fine. I guess my question is, is that like, since uh, Black Twitter is, you know, being extinct or becoming extinct- Apparently. And, <laughs> yeah, you know, and I'm just like, okay. And now we're going to TikTok, I've mm-hmm. seen, the uh there's a lot of white women that oh don't call us karen and i think it's actually really awesome that it's a video based because now there's Mm -hmm. these duets from black creators and they're like how about stop stealing our content Mm -hmm. how about you know acknowledging Mm -hmm. that uh you know the uh, the idea of the karen or the asterisk that got right right that horrible and so it's just like yeah. as um as we evolve to TikTok I'm wondering yeah. how that's going to evolve for our like you know participation and interaction with these yeah. sensitive souls mm-hmm. <laughs> definitely sensitive souls you're totally I'm yeah. waiting for someone to write about this topic <laughs> from, from the white femininity point of view because Ooh. I I write about blackness and I want to stay in my lane in that in that yes. way but the other you know wonderful folks Jesse Daniels and others write about about whiteness mm-hmm. and white femininity to your oh, question yeah. about TikTok oh did I interrupt you Mm-mm. okay to your question about TikTok I'm thinking about two things and I must say I'm not on TikTok yet I have resisted 
you know, so like I'm getting there, the research will come. Um, one, I'm learning quite a bit of algorithm. The algorithmic makeup of TikTok seems to be highly personalized in ways that we're not seeing from other platforms. So the For You page, I'm understanding, is incredibly personalized to people's content um, in a way that can be harmful, like the racial trauma thing I'm talking about. So as soon as TikTok figures out you're Black or you like Black things, whatever that means, uh, you're going to get a host of of information uh, for better or for worse. And so I'm curious on what that means for black users, right? Um, so that's one. And then two, I'm also thinking about remixing. So this idea of remixing isn't new, right? Like having video in the background and putting yourself in front of the video, Jenkins writes about this, but I think you're onto something. Like TikTok is doing something different in terms of responding to Karen's um, in a way that like a tweet might not be able to. And I think that's fascinating for what I'm thinking through because I don't wanna be bound by a platform. If Twitter goes away tomorrow, black discursive practices are still gonna be here. Same for TikTok, right? Same for whatever's next. So it's not necessarily about the platform as much as it is what we bring to the technology, if that makes sense. That makes sense. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. And Lando and I actually have a, 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 a short piece on flow that'll be coming out next couple of weeks that looks at that looks at culture vultures in these spaces. Whoa. So, right. So, so, you know, as, as, um, as black creativity um, mm -hmm. is really uh, exploding in places yep. that people are trying to steal that. So what does that, that look like? The cultural right. appropriation. And it's easy, mm -hmm. right? Like the whole point of TikTok is to layer mm -hmm. content. I can't wait for that that piece and flow. Yeah, yeah. I'll make sure that I, that I share that Jeez, with that's you. Cool. All right. Professor Nishime, please, please share your question. Hello. Oh, thank, thank you so much for your talk. It was great. I'm excited about this book. Oh, thank you. Um, but I was actually caught by something that you were saying early on about some of the collaborative work that you're doing um, and that you're saying that there's, you know, issues that come up when you're trying to think about African-American culture in the aggregate, right, in sort of large scale studies. Could you talk yeah. a little bit more about that? Yeah, thank you for that question. So um, I have worked with some computer scientists now for five years or so. And we came about as an ad hoc group when I was a PhD student, so maybe it was more than five years, of people just interested in algorithms and people interested in, in race. The first year really was just getting on the same page in terms of um, epistemolo epistemology and language and what we mean, what they mean by certain terms and what we mean. Like really, it took a long time just for us to be able to talk to each other. I'll give you an example. Um, one of my dear friends now in the group was like, what is race? Like, just tell me, what is it? And he's wanting like a definition. He's wanting like a thing you can measure and study, right? Um, and we know that it's not that simple. <laughs> and so it, it took a while for us to send them articles and vice versa. So in that group then, we sort of came to a point after writing about um, uh, the piece I mentioned, let me see if I can share my screen again, was about immigration. So we came to a point where we're like, why aren't we talking to each other? Like computer science people, critical race people, it's not going away, right? Like this issue is not going away in terms of data sciences. Computer science folks are writing about race. Like um, folks, I don't know if you've seen, have published about, if you have darker skin, certain hand so soaps, right, won't dispense or, yeah, just gross. So they're writing about it. And they're, many of them are interested in discrimination. In many ways, though, race is understood um, biologically. So like the skin tone, that's how I'm going to measure it. Or by your last name. So they some folks use census data and they pull census data for Native Americans or whatever. And then they scrape data and say, you're Native American because so-and-so says so, right? Like super problematic stuff. And so that's what we're interested in is how do we responsibly um, study algorithms uh, at scale? So I pull up my screen to show you 
the slide here. So I didn't um, talk about it in the talk for the, the um, sake of time, but this slide um, gets into the political personalization uh, article. So this one up top, measuring political personalization in Google News Search. And in that piece, what we're talking about is um, a racialized discourse community. So how can we understand, for example, politics and race immigration through the frame of immigration um, in a way that gets us to study race at scale? And I'll show you what I mean. Oh, the slide was hidden here. So what we did was we had two profiles. It was a white genocide profile and a pro-immigration. It's called Define American on Twitter. Um, and then we talk in the paper about how, you know, they're racialized in different ways. White genocide is literally about like, they feel like the world is coming to an end for white people, right? So they're very anti-immigration. Then we crawl the Twitter timelines of each. We collect URLs of each, assuming that people who are posting under white genocide um, URLs are in agreement with, with that discourse. Um, and then this is a computer scientist where they come in. They do, they did some browser profile trainings on different laptops, and then they had to train them on certain times of the day. So very official stuff. Um, in order to train Google and Google News as a search engine to understand that laptop as an anti-immigration person or as a pro-immigration person. Right. So not by last name, not by, uh, you know, all the other biological markers, but a racialized discourse. And then what we did was we searched for terms like illegal immigration, Obama. Um, you know, it's interesting. We searched for car loans, house loans, credit scores. So like um, that kind of stuff. And then the results, um, probably not surprising, the results came back in Google News with pro-immigration articles for the the pro-immigration profile, anti-immigration for the anti-immigration. So it's not surprising, but it's really hard to publish on because number one, algorithms are proprietary. So we don't know what, what Google News' algorithms are. Um, and number two, you can see how doing this kind of work, res I think responsibly. So in a way that's not categorizing race as just biological. And so that's what we're hoping to do with the ICA paper is more like a meta, like stepping back and saying like, we can talk to each other and here's how we talk about racialized discourse communities. That was really long, sorry. Did that answer your question? Actually, that's super helpful. Oh, cool. super helpful. And especially in trying to think what are some of the other ways we might be able to get at race or think about race as sort of a social construct and totally. still be able to use the term. Yeah. Even if it's not, even if we're not going to say, well, you know, we can, we can just sort of tell. Right, right, right. I'm also inspired by, I was reading a media effects paper and journal of calm recently. The author's name escapes me, but they're arguing that we can um, marry media effects, which we know is like quant based with critical race. So like you know, bridging disciplines is hard, but I think when it comes to digital media studies, we we can't keep talking past each other. Um, I think they need us in terms of computer science and, and vice versa. That was wonderful. Um, and as, as you were talking, I had to, I also have to say for all the graduate students who are here watching, that was, um, a, a showcase in how to do a presentation. <laughs> you can see that, you know, part of what you do is you anticipate, I'm just, just to, to live the middle for a second, you anticipate what a question is gonna be. You see that um, Professor Barg Loy had, the, had all of those grayed out and then was able to call it and it was so beautifully, beautifully done, so Thank smooth. You. Thank you. You just, you just did a model for us. All right, um, Julie Ann Winkelstein, would you like to come and ask your question, please? As they're unmuting, um, you know I get excited when I just looked at the thing. You know I get excited when the hair like just goes. So just forgive me. <laughs> <laughs> this is yeah. It's this is this is really really exciting work. This is really exciting work. Yeah. For for those of you who think what we do is just kind of boring with our computers all day, right? we get we 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 nerd, we're, we're nerds. We nerd out on this. We love uh -huh. it. I don't know if Ju Julianne is here. Um, uh, uh, Su uh, Suhani, do you want to ask this question? question yeah, I can ask it. Here? yeah, 
Sure. Um, yeah, I was just thinking about censorship in terms of social media. Um, I've seen a lot of censorship just recently, even in this past summer. And I was thinking about how that would progress maybe Black resistance and activism to different mm. media. So even thinking about TikTok and why TikTok is working, yeah. why some parts of it aren't working and thinking about the algorithm yeah. even. Um, yeah, so I was just kind of thinking about that. Yeah. Um, thanks for that question, Suhani. So I'm reading quite a bit about shadow banning on TikTok. And I think that's where you're going. So I'm going to ask you a follow-up question because I think that's where you're going. So it seems like TikTok, you can't even say the word white. You have to say like W-H-1-T-E because you'll get banned. Like they're very strict, it seems, which I think has... um, something to say about corporate structures here. Like it's not just about censorship, but who owns the media um, and, and what gets popularized. But I'm gonna ask you a follow-up question, Suhani. What are you interested in regarding censorship and digital media? Yeah, I was specifically thinking more about Instagram. I actually don't have TikTok. Okay, okay. So, yeah, I haven't seen well yeah I <laughs> haven't seen TikTok at all but yeah I was thinking more about Instagram and I was even thinking about like because I've seen a lot of people comment on how TikTok works more for them and, and works more for their activism so I was kind of thinking just like on that no oh okay so you're thinking about Instagram and activism and- yeah like kind of like the progression like yeah. using different forms of social media and uh, yeah Ooh, this is cool so um in a lot of my work, the care chapter, for example, I think about the ways that Black users sort of hack the algorithms in order to work around them um, for their own gains or for their own um, methods of care. So, for example, many of the women actually this semester, the groups are still being transcribed. So this is just off the top of my head. Um, this semester, many of the women are talking about um, how do I be who I am online? So be black, be a woman, do all the things, um, but also protect my space because I know Instagram is going to, is going to know that I'm black, right? They know this is the content I like based on cultural tastes, you know, for better, or for worse. Um, but I can't control what content then gets directed toward me. And again, I'm talking about racial trauma, especially in light of the Derek Chauvin trial, right? Uh, that just wrapped up. So I'm interested in, in censorship from the user end, like from the, like what users are doing to sidestep censorship. I don't know if that answers your question. It it absolutely exists. Like algorithms are there in order to personalize content. So feel free to follow up if I didn't answer. No, no, that was, that was, yeah, that was really fascinating. Honestly, I, I didn't think about it in terms of even like what you were saying earlier about who owns like the different corporate or the different social medias and thinking mm-hmm. of it in terms of like a corporate structure. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah. That, no, no, that's, that's really interesting. Yeah. Cool. Thank you. I taught a power and culture class last year. Um, and we talked about powerful institutions from a black feminist point of view. So the domains of power I was talking about, but through digital technologies. So what does it mean that Facebook owns Instagram? Um, yeah. Lots of questions when it comes to institutions and power. And and I think that the the, the resistance is it, it feels like with with this generation of of students um, mm-hmm. that the students that we have right now are our undergraduates and our younger graduate students that it's that it's different mm-hmm. you know that that even I, I remember this really really clearly um, one of when I was a brand new assistant professor started teaching in two thousand five mm-hmm. and um, there was a student who made made a comment about. Um, you know, well, it's okay knowing that people are, are, are marketing towards me because I'm either, I'm a Nike person or I'm a Adidas person. And then it's like a shortcut. And, and right. he was maybe in the extreme, but right. but the students weren't, um, weren't really resisting that in the yeah. ways in which I think that um, mm-hmm. with, I think being in this space of constant digital surveillance, mm-hmm. students are, are really conscious of that and um, yeah. are suspicious. Oh, totally. Um, and are and are and are incredible critics. I think there's a there's a natural critical mm-hmm. um, proclivity that has come with their constant mm. uh, presence on social media that that I don't know yeah. that that we have people um, appreciate. I think you're totally right. I mean, reports came out over a decade ago, right, of 
um, when you buy a plane ticket on your phone versus plane ticket on your laptop, mm. the prices will differ. Or mm. I remember seeing one about PCs. You, It was Amazon. When you buy something on Amazon from a PC, it would be less expensive yeah. than from a Mac um, because Amazon assumed you got more money with Macs. Mm -hmm. um, but you're right. Like this generate, I think students now are sort of resisting that that level of personalization. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And they're being shadow banned all the time, right? So they're, they're, they're understanding that they have to figure out how to work around it. Mm -hmm. Right. And so, and they're, and they're, they're kind of, they're tweaking things and they're right. figuring out what is, what is resistance look like in these spaces, like instant, um, which is, instant, instant, yeah, instant, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Julie Ann, you want to come, come and ask your question? Yeah. Can you hear me now? Yes. Oh, I could. I'm sorry. We couldn't hear you before. It's it's okay. I, I I'm connected from a laptop to a monitor, and I'm never sure what to talk into. Um, so my question is about socioeconomic status. You can see the question right in the chat. Oh. So I the the work that I do is around homelessness um, and poverty, and so I'm interested in whenever there are conversations like this, it seems like there's sort of a default assumption that the people mm -hmm. that you're talking about have access to the. Yes electricity, yeah. to devices, to houses yeah. and stuff. So I'm just wondering yeah. if you're just living with that fact and that not worrying about it, or if that is some aspect of your work. Totally. I, I really appreciate your question, Julianne. Absolutely. There's an assumption. Um, and that's one of the debates in our field, digital media. Um, you can't, you can't assume everybody has access to technology. In my focus group research I did in St. Louis, I recruited from the University City Public Library, uh, which has no affiliation to a particular university. That's just what it's called. So I particularly wanted to uh, recruit women outside of the college age sample. Um, and although the research was about people online, I wanted them to be able to use the public computer if they wanted to, right? And I actually got a sample of uh, women ages, I want to say like 18 to 49 for that one. Um, so for me, I intentionally recruit from places and spaces in order to grab um, and include as many voices so as not to rely on that assumption. Um, I was going to say another thing. Your question reminded me of the digital divide debate, which a lot of critical race digital scholars have pushed back on. So the digital divide, divide debate being um, maybe 10 years ago, scholar, digital media scholars started writing about Black folks as lacking technology prowess. And we need to go save those, we need to save these communities with STEM tools and because black people just don't have phones and bike pop people just need help with technology. And at least in the last 10 years, folks like Andre Brock, Sophia Noble and others have really pushed back against that digital divide. And um, Anna Everett, for example, has written that we've all, we've been on online, right? Like, Black publics have have found ways to integrate ourselves with technologies. It may not look the same, um, but that's also a debate going on in the field. Does that make sense? Yeah, no, I appreciate you. I appreciate you bringing that up, that aspect of it. I, the work that I do, the people I see, they don't have the access. It, mm -hmm. they, they may have the prowess. Yeah. They have the access. And so, yeah. and even libraries, because that's what my field, I teach at UW a class on homelessness and libraries, in fact. Mm -hmm. um, and I, even libraries, there are certain people who are excluded from libraries. Yeah. So you may yeah. have some people, but the libraries are doing very well right. at creating rules and um, regulations and public conduct policies and all sorts of things to kick certain people out. Mm. So even using a library could be trouble. It could be- um, No, it's true. Unless yeah. you really work through the social worker or something. Right. If, if like in your area. Right. Um, in Seattle, there is a social worker there. But anyway, thank you. Um, Thanks for your presentation. I, I really appreciate your question. And I, I think there's so much room for collaboration. Like there's so much room for collaboration when it comes to socioeconomic status and, and experts like you who, who know the work about libraries in order to integrate it into what we do regarding digital technologies. Yeah, I'm always up for, for that. Yeah, thanks. <laughs> it sounds great, thanks. Excellent, excellent. Um, 
There were a couple of questions in the chat um, and uh, two people wanted to, to have you comment on um, if social media algorithms tend to favor the bolstering or the amplification of white issues hmm. or white activism. So um, Jackson and Chelsea both had that question hmm. for you. Thank you. What might you say? And, and you guys can, can pop on um, yeah. and add to that, please. please. Um, um, thank you for that question. I have not read anything or done work about white activists. What I am thinking about is performative allyship. So I've seen quite a bit of this. Your question gets back to the point of how do we know who is white online? How do we know somebody, you know, is a particular race online? And that gets back to Dr. Nishimi's question, right, about um, studying race and, and racialized discourses. So I answer your question by deflecting to performative allyship, because I can't say that algorithms know somebody is white. I, I think they know a discourse might be more dominant, right, or, or might be more white. What I know from my focus groups are, especially this semester, um, performative allyship seems to be the thing that they are so tired of online that I didn't see in my 2017 data. So the women are saying, and I, the women I'm talking about now are community members, students, faculty members, staff. Um, they're saying, I know white folks in my circle and they've never said Black Lives Matter. They've never checked on me. They've, but online, like the hashtags are real, right? And so I don't know about the algorithms, but I know that the women themselves, um, that's a part of their trauma is not the right word, but that's a part of what they have to deal with in terms of care. Like, how do I rectify seeing you online, talk about Black Lives Matter all day long? And, and then in person, you, you're not here to support me. But other people like jump in if if you Jackson or Chelsea if you had had other ideas. Oh uh, no, that uh, answers. It. Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah. I was also I was really curious about like the aspect of um not like typing out white on TikTok, but having to put like like I was really interested in that aspect as well. Mm hmm. Yeah, I don't know enough about TikTok yet. Like I said, that's an interest that I'm like dabbling in. Um. But I know it's a thing, like users right now have to say white with the exclamation point. Yeah, thanks for that question. I mean, and it's interesting. We had some some research at here at the, the UW um, with some of our colleagues talking about the ways in which you can actually engage in conversations about productive conversations about race online. Mm -hmm. And if you can't even use any form of racialized language, right. how can it possibly be a space to engage totally. in dialogue? Right. right. So I think it's 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 identifying that platform is actually this platform is not the space where we want to have any kind of discussion. Mm -hmm. um, so that's mm -hmm. that's an interesting way in which it's just and talk kind of about the racing race. Right. And and mm -hmm. most racial. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, it's just it's clearly like it's 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 probably just very fear, fear based. Right. Um, I see our uh, Ph.D. student Michelle Sturgis has a question. Michelle, you want to come and ask your question, please? Hello. Hey. Um, thank you so much for your talk, Dr. Mirage Lloyd. Um, I've been really looking forward to it. And I'm very excited uh, for this talk, especially because my students are here and yeah. um, our class this quarter is on the formation of Karen. Uh, and so along with um, Princess Diana and Angelina Jolie, we are focusing on Charlize Theron. And so we've been Whoa. watching several of her films. Um, yeah and uh, really theorizing what does it mean, um, this formation of Karen. And so uh, this was super relevant and so yeah. much stuff, it, it was taking me some time to digest it and, and to think about what kind of question I wanna bring up, um, especially- I wanna visit your class. <laughs> come, come. <laughs> um, uh, so, but so here are some things that I'm like yeah. picking up on and, yeah. and I do have uh, two questions for you, um, but, uh, one thing that I am noticing is, is that um, with the formation of Karen, there seems to be a proximity that uh, that is happening. Um, so, for in order for someone to to call the police on on an, on a family or um, a young person that's um, selling water, right? They they're they're in proximity to each other, but there's also this like. Uh, lack of closeness and, yeah. and understanding. So I think yeah. that's the kind of inter interesting tension there. 
Um, and I also really appreciated the way that you separated out uh, uh, white women from uh, white womanhood, right. and um, it's something that I'm really, really trying to push my students to to think right. about. Um, especially at a PWI, a predominantly white institution, I think that there's um, instantly this kind of reaction of like, um, right, this the this topic is about me, right. and I'm right. actually trying to give them some space to to uh, engage with it. So mm -hmm. um, I also appreciate, and uh, Dr. Joseph co-signed this, but the the um, the fact that the Karen is not a stereotype, um, right, and, right. and really this is for two reasons because right. um, it's an empowered group uh, that this image is applying to, and also who's doing this uh, naming of the group um, is coming from a more disenfranchised right. group. Absolutely, um, definitely not a stereotype. Right. Uh, and um, so, so the students are going to be doing. Um, they're engaging with uh, making comics, mm. and uh, so there. There's two comics. One is the formation of Karen, drawing primarily on our representations of Charlize Theron, and then the second one is their relationship to Karen. So it's really asking them to understand their own identity and yeah. how that influences the way in which they're cool. engaging with this formation. Mm -hmm. um, but so, what I wanted to ask you about is. Um, how and then and I also picked up on this part and Lando was talking about it too, which is the the cultural appropriation. And so what I find really valuable from your talk is you're saying that the the naming of Karen is is coming from Black publics online, mm -hmm. and that there that um, this is an important story. And mm -hmm. so how can especially the white students in my class how can they engage with this story? How can they instantiate their own version yeah. of white uh, womanhood or yeah. their identity as a white woman? Is what right. I mean. How can they um, instantiate that with while still respecting or, mm -hmm. or not appropriating yeah. this important story that exists? So right. I think kind of going into it, I was like, I want them to challenge the Karen. Obviously these are bad attitudes, behaviors that need to be challenged, mm -hmm. but um, how can they do that in a way that that actually I think brings us back to that um, proximity right. and closeness without appropriating right. um, or just like trashing, because like you're saying, there's a history to it. And I'm glad you're, you're saying that because that's, that's my deep um, desire for black digital studies is um, revealing the complexities of Black folks online. So it's not just a Karen meme that you can easily retweet and laugh because Black folks are funny. Like there's actually a history of racial humor. There's a history of inversion, right? That um, that's important to know, I think. Um, and important, like you're saying, to respect. And hopefully that plays offline too, because then you're respecting somebody barbecuing in the park somebody talking in a different language that doesn't sound like yours, right? Somebody eating with their family that doesn't look like yours or whatever. Um, hopefully we're getting to understand complexities here of culture. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank yeah. You. I um, made the mistake, Michelle. Oh, sorry, you had a question. Sorry. No, no, no. What were you going to say? Or I was going to say, I made the mistake in my digital culture class this semester of start the first day assigning a Karen article. It was like a pop culture. And it, I mean, I thought it would be a good way to like start, but they, students feel very strongly. I should have like, you know, gotten into it later. <laughs> <laughs> but it was yeah. funny. <laughs> yes. This, well, I, I, I don't want to call it a mistake, but it's definitely an exploration and a journey of, of it really being the focus of the class. I think for, 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 for many students and myself included really yeah. sitting yeah. this and I, as I can imagine, um, in your book project too, right? There's just a lot here. So um, the the only other thing I was going to yeah. ask then is because yeah. they're doing a very visual uh, medium yeah. working with comics, um, and I loved the memes that you showed, and you and you did kind of mention uh, some of these visual elements. But I would just be curious to hear from you um, mm -hmm. what 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 is this uh, Karen look like? So I like some of the visuals that I noticed you pointed to were like uh, like or that showed up were cell phones. Mm -hmm. And um, I think kind of a big one is like yoga pants, but I'm curious mm -hmm. if you have any other um, uh, visuals of the character yeah. that might be able to lend or permit Patty or Becky, right. yeah. any of them. <laughs> right. I appreciate <laughs> that question. And 
the Karen meme has also extended to anti-maskers too, right? So this is even beyond just barbecues and, and permit patties. So in terms of visuals, uh, we know the hairstyle from black humor meme. So the Bob or whatever. Um, I'm, I think, and I think Dr. Joseph mentioned this, there's something here about class when it comes to white femininity. There's something about gender when it comes to white femininity, because these women are not necessarily, you know, Met Gala going people, right? These, but I think that's important. These are everyday women, maybe who wear Lulu Lemon or whatever those pants are called. Um, but but I think there's an everydayness to the visuals of the women that's important because the Black folks online are trying to say we, this is every day that we see this every day. This isn't an, a spectacular um, instance. Mm-hmm. I think that was that is a great note for us to um to go out on it's already five o'clock um we had such a, a spirited <laughs> wonderful this is um, fun q a yeah thank you so much thank you so much for joining us thank you so much for closing out our race and media colloquium series um a huge thank you to the rest of our colloquium committee yes. uh professors uh Leilani nishime and andrea tanis and um gina Aftab, who is off at another job now, but we really appreciate her. We really want to thank um, uh, we're, we're uh, Anu and 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 Megan um, for for all of the wonderful work that they have done, as well as Tommy for doing the flyers, and also for the the CCDE RA team for Lando and Laura and for Jazz for all of the work that they did as well for the entire entire series. So thank you all for your um, for your hard work.